You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEgroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means it is Thursday. It is 1.30 p.m. Central, 2.30 p.m. over there on the East Coast time once again for TWIFO this week in Futures Options. My name is Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-compelling, at least we think so, Options Insider radio network. There are a legion, a plethora, just a tsunami. <laughs> of ways for you guys to get the content these days. I'm not joking. There are literally more platforms hitting us up every day. There's new ones in my inbox. I'm looking at them right now as we speak, trying to add our stuff. It's amazing how many on-demand audio outlets are out there now. Got some new ones popping up, verbals, like reasons and other ones. So many. You thought it was just iTunes and maybe Spotify and maybe Google Podcasts. Nay, there are a legion <laughs> more every day. So on demand, you can get it pretty much anywhere under the sun, including YouTube. A lot of you like to get it there as well. Of course, you want to go above and beyond. Join us live in the secret club, theoptioninsider.com slash plus is the place to go to get all the live stuff. If you want to go above and beyond that and get access to all the cool exclusive shows, including the great pro Q&A we did earlier this week, as well as options oddities coming up tomorrow to break down the world of unusual activity, then theoptioninsider.com slash pro is the place to go for all of that fun. And of course, however you listen live after the fact, hit us up questions, comments, insights, pearls of wisdom, play along in our Twitter polls. A lot of fun stuff to keep you guys engaged throughout the week. And let's see who we're hearing from on the old program today, doing double duty, holding down the CME group and the FTSE Russell hot seats. He is a busy man. He is straddling two seats at once. Our old friend, Mr. Russell Rhodes, now holding down uh, his hot seat over there at the Kelly School of Business by way of EQ Derivatives. The once in future Dr. Bix himself. Mr. Rhodes, welcome back to the program, sir. Thank you. And 
It's 1.30 where you are. It's 7.30 where I am. I'm in London, baby. Oh, are you and at I IDX? Got, I didn't realize you I went. did go to IDX, oh. but I took the day off, and I saw the Bond movie today, and spoiler alert, Han Solo gets killed. <laughs> So you're beaming in from across the pond. I didn't even realize that, I sir. Thinking, no, I know you didn't. That's why I was going to surprise you with that one. And you I didn't. did get to see the Bond movie. And then I saw a bunch of guys on the street in tuxes, and they were going to the Bond movie in IMAX. There is something so, cool about seeing a Bond movie in London. I have never done that, it, sir. It's, it was worth the $50 for the ticket. $50? And that, and that, and that was the, I mean, that is what it cost. Is the pound up to five bucks? What's going on over no, there? it's not that. It was like 35, 40 pounds, or it was like 35 pounds or so, so. Did you see it with like in-person masseuse while you were watching? What the hell did you see? What version no, did you see? I, saw, I did see it in IMAX, though. And they, ha- and they charged more for like the higher up seats. And, and so I, I had the premium IMAX seat, which is the most expensive one. Dang. But, wow. Uh, yeah, I know. But I was like, you know what? I, I've. It, I mean, everybody says they're a Bond fan, but it was just one of those things that it was one of the few things my father and I always did together. And I was like, man, I'm here. It's right down the street. And I got the last ticket in the premium area. So, <laughs> so you your one word review or two word really thumbs up, thumbs down. What do you give to the Bond? Effing awesome. Ooh, there we go. There's your NSFW <laughs> two word review as we keep on rolling right on into the Movers and Shakers report. It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers Report. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Movers and Shakers Report, the portion of the show. We break down everything that is moving and shaking over there in the world of all things products. All the products really lighten it up over there at CME. To the light side, a.k.a. the upside, and to the dark side. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, where should we begin our journey this week? And also, B, in general, where do you fall on the the Daniel Craig oeuvre, his generation of Bond, sir? Are you into it? Not so much? I am very much into it. I really, I I feel like they've been the most realistic of all of them. I think Casino Royale is amazing. I think Casino Royale brought Bond back in an amazing, I'm not sure they've ever lived up to that since. You think this one lives up to that? Well... Yes, because of the format that I saw it in. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. No. How's that? I, I, it's difficult. You know, it's apples and oranges, as you like to say sometimes. <laughs> so me, it's, for um, me, it's Casino Royale and then Skyfall for him and then kind of all the rest. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then if I go back so, to my days as a kid, which is funny to think of Bond watching it as a kid, but it was very much a kid's thing in the 80s because it was Roger Moore. For your eyes only, nothing will ever top that for me. That was... That was like a G.I. Joe cartoon come to life. They were climbing the mountain yeah. with crossbows. They were throwing knives. They were, it, was, it was like G.I. Joe brought to life. So that was amazing to me. I'm not sure if any Bond film will ever transcend that in my young eyes, sir. Yeah, I think this, uh, I'll, I'll call it a tie right now, and then I'll let everybody else make up their minds on it. But there's just nothing like rubbing in everybody's face that I've already seen the darn thing. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm glad you got to take advantage of that. Really quickly, any interesting nuggets on IDX, that's very much a, a futures-oriented event. Any interesting things coming uh, across there? Everybody's still trying to work out the the, the ESG thing, was you know, which I, I don't think anybody would really be surprised at. Um, I, you know, everybody's starting to offer more and more ways to get ESG exposure, and there are people. I, I, I do think in time that uh, those various products that have been launched in the last couple of years will will kick off. It seems like there was a lull there while we were more worried about a pandemic. Uh, but that was probably the biggest topic discussed. Um, really? So, ESG? Interesting. Yeah. Interesting yeah. stuff. Yeah. So, well, and keep, keep in mind, I'm in Europe where it's a bigger deal than in the U.S. That's true. And by the way, I yeah. can only just say right now, I'm sure our audience is thankful for it. You need to do all of your shows from London. You sound better than when you're down the street. <laughs> I don't know what what connection they have you on over there across the pond, but have at it. So what did you choose? I'm sorry, we got derailed by ESG and Bob. I never said. Light side or dark I side? Saw, since I just saw a spy movie, let's do dark side. All right, let's go there. Yeah, I was all excited for Spectre. I thought that one looked kind of cool. Nah, not so much so. Yeah, it's kind of been hit or miss, but Casino Royale, yeah, that one really kind of got me. I wasn't that into Bond anymore, and then Casino Royale kind of brought me back in. What's the old saying? Godfather Part 3, that terrible movie, but has that one good line, just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. All right, let's see if I can pull you back in here with a little bit of light side, dark side. By the way, listeners, this this chart is it's about as even as I've seen it in quite some time. It's pretty much 50-50 light side, dark side, even though 
the extreme end of the upside is much more aggressive than the extreme end of the downside in terms of size movement. But in terms of number of players on each side, we got a pretty even breakdown. If you want to see this chart for yourselves, the folks at CME always tweet it out right before showtime. We always retweet it. So if you're following one of us, you can see it for yourselves. To the dark side we go. It's interesting. Bitcoin just, just got kicked out of the bottom five. It was off nearly 3%, about 2.96%. That only makes it to the number six spot. Number five, we've got the Ultra 30-year over there off three, almost 3.2%, about 3.19%. Number four, the old NASDAQ E-mini. Haven't seen NASDAQ in this list in a little while. Off 3.27%. Kind of shows you the crazy topsy-turvy week that we're having. Number three, a lot of medals here for the rest of our bottom five here, listeners. Number three is copper off 3.51%. Numero dos here is platinum off 3.59%. And again, it does some paper around 1,500 contracts or so. It's not a ton to parse, but I suppose we could. And then number one, good old palladium again off 6%. By the way, platinum last week was number three in the other direction, up nearly 6%. And palladium is off 6% this week. It was number two to the dark side last week off 6.63%. So intriguing stuff. And again, before you get super jazzed about palladium, Around 400 contracts going up over there. Let's go to the upside. Number five, the old euro dollars up 5.56%. It was number four in the other direction last week, off 3.85%. Then we got a whole swath of things that don't do a lot of options paper <laughs> for the rest of the top five, except for one. A number four, lean hogs up 8.41%. So again, amount wise, in terms of how many players are on each side, the graph is pretty even. But of course, the extremity of the move the aggressive nature of the move is stronger on the upside this week as you can see cost you 5.56 percent to break into the top five versus only 3.19 percent for the dark side number four lean hogs up 8.41 percent number three i mentioned before one of my stealth product categories to keep an eye on one of the listeners asked last week or a couple of weeks ago i mentioned the dairy keep an eye on that and it's moving again this week to number three up 8.95 Percent number two is a frequent offender these days. It is Nat Gas up 13 and three quarters percent. It was number three in the last week, took a rear week off last week, off 6.58 percent. And then number one with a bullet, <laughs> just a ridiculous bullet. Uh, again, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I, I wish, I wish there were a ton of options trading here in the U.S. on this thing. Unfortunately, that is not the case, but it is the beast yet again. Iron ore up 34.42%. It's been our number one for the last three weeks. Last week, it was up nearly 35%. You had to say to yourself last week, okay, that's got to be it. It has to top out here. It was up 20% the week before that. How much more upside could it have? Well, if you said almost another 35%, <laughs> you were correct. The only other thing we've seen even close to this is the lumber run we saw for a while there, where it was kind of dominating our move for a while. Bitcoin has flirted with it a few weeks, but not as long as this, and certainly not to this extreme. We haven't seen 35% up days in Bitcoin. We haven't seen a 30% down day, but that's about as close as this gotten. So intriguing stuff. I think given how many metals here are dominating our tape, including the iron ore, but let's hang out there first. Let's talk some metals. Werewolves beware. It's time to explore the options activity in silver, gold, and other shiny things. It's time to talk metals. All right, everybody. Welcome to the metals. You guys know where to find all these reports we're going to break down here on the show. Seemegroup.com slash TWIFO, T-W-I-F-O, or slash TWIO, T-W-I-O. Both of those should work. Watch the cases. For some reason, uppercase tends to throw these for a loop, but if you keep lowercase, you should be good. Then you get on out there to that list. Once you see the list, get on out to the drop down there. You'll see a bunch of different categories. Got to go all the way down to the bottom because it's alphabetical for the metals, listeners. And that's where we're going to hang out there today. Before we get to all the fun stuff, just given the fact that it has been moving quite a bit, I think we're going to, we'll start with some of the shiny stuff. But Mr. Rose, before we get to that, you are overseas. So it is appropriate then to discuss a product that kind of primarily trades overseas, but is still moving a ton. And that is iron ore. I mean, it's just insane. Again, I wish I could parse it from an options perspective. Can't really do that here. But what's lighting up your tape? And our folks, were they talking about this at IDX? I mean, this thing is just on fire. 
nobody brought up iron ore. I mean, really, it was uh, very much of the financials in ESG. But um, the iron ore thing, I've been doing some work with a couple of the Asia exchanges, and it's it's like the most actively traded thing sometimes at a couple of exchanges over there. It's a huge, huge market. And I think some of the supply chain issues that we are having around the world, and they're having supply chain issues over here in London, just like we are in the U.S., uh, I think that's really causing some issues with a key component to creating steel. Yes, yes, indeed, out there. So I, again, we'll keep an eye on it. I mean, it's hard to ignore it. It's moving so much. The amount of analysis we can do here is kind of limited. The options paper just isn't there. But again, it's a fascinating one. Let's hang out here. Let's start really quickly because they are the big dogs in the metal spot, even though they weren't in our movers and shakers this week. Gold and silver were making headlines this week, though. Gold hit their lowest settlement, I believe this was on Wednesday, in about six months. So gold coming off pretty hard, and it has been coming off for some time, kind of hit its six-month nadir this week. Silver also doing something similar, dropping to pretty much the lowest it's been since July of 2020. Remember all those heady days not that long ago? Oh, here comes the silver squeeze. Yeah, not so much. And we've been kind of in the other side of that pretty much ever since so we did see gold a little bit lower on wednesday 1722 almost 1723 that was close to a a six month low out there coming into showtime now we are seeing gold a little bit north of that i think some of the uncertainty and the sell-off going on the equities and everything else today may be driving a little bit of this gold upside because now net on the week gold is actually up ever so slightly up about a quarter of a percent nearly five points so it has clawed its way back from the red and is now ever so slightly in the green right now. Before I keep going with gold and silver, Mr. Rhodes, anything coming across your tape as the metals have had a bit of a uh, dark period, sir? I, 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 they're not acting like they should. <laughs> you know, I just don't know how else to put that. Uh, I, and, and I'm not doing particularly well being long either of those <laughs> markets. But I, I really do expect a pickup. Uh, in gold and silver, because I do think that that we're going to continue. People are going to start to realize that the uh, the inflation that we all say is transitory is not transitory. Uh, but so far, we're not getting confirmation out of silver, gold, or even copper. Uh, and my, I'll tell you, my long copper, short iron ore spread is killing me. <laughs> I knew you'd like that. Uh, that would be rough. Uh, no, if that I'm was not trading it, but if I, if I could, I probably would. Cause... If you were short that leg that's up 35% a week, yeah, that could uh, that could come back yeah. to bite you. Yes. <laughs> but you're right. Yeah, it is fascinating. I was just joking on our show earlier. You know, the Fed has been beating this drum of, oh, it's transitory. Oh, it's transitory. We just announced on our option block, talked about how the dollar store is now lifting their prices to a buck twenty five and a buck fifty because of effectively what we're seeing out there. The inflationary pressure is the logistics. So if even the dollar store is raising their prices, it's kind of hard to say the inflation is transitory. Yet uh, that's where we find ourselves these days with Mr. Powell. Still beating that drum. It's all it's all it's all gonna go away. All these wages that are so much higher, this is gonna go back down. Don't worry about it. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain out there. Instead, let's keep on rolling before we go deep into the the Fed rabbit hole. I can see people's eyes glazing over out there already. Decent paper out there in the gold this week. List. There's nearly 200,000 contracts on the tape right now. Just a couple of thousand shy of that. And of that, looks like about a third. So we're talking about, yeah, about 32% in the November contract that has about 26 days to go. It is so refreshing to parse the metals because they don't do all their paper in contracts with one day to go, like the equities and a lot of other products these days. They give us some time to sink our teeth into them. By the way, if you're wondering what is gold vol out there in November, it's about a 14 and a third up, not quite a full point, about about nine tenths of a point this week. And again, gold vol, metals vol in general has kind of been known for having these short, quick spurts, these quick sparks of life, and then kind of settling back down into whatever range it has been. And Seems like gold is, is languishing out there around that 14 handle. In terms of skew, last week, the puts 6.1% rich. This week, almost 8%. So puts getting a nice little bit out there. The calls last week, 2.7% cheap. This week, nearly 4%. So calls getting cheaper. Puts getting more bid. Dare I say it, this feels like an equity. Obviously, nowhere near to the same degree. If you pull up you know, the E-mini right now, the puts going to be 25 to 30% bid and the call is going to be 15 to 20 odd percent offered. So not quite to the same degree, but uh, shape wise, 
it has a very familiar shape to it. In terms of what is the leading contract out here, I said we're at about a 1756 coming into showtime. If you said the November 16 half puts, you would be winner, winner, chicken dinner. I know I wouldn't have said that. So uh, you'd be <laughs> far more versed in the flow of uh, gold, apparently, than I. Because, yeah, these 16 half puts in November are where the action is. A full 100 points below where we are right now. They've been trading pretty actively all week, including uh, on Monday about 2,700. Pretty much most of that opening. Looks like it might have been a vertical close paper, about 3,000 as well of the 1,600 puts went up that day. So maybe a 1,600, 16 and a half vertical coming up close to 3,000 times. The rest of the week, though, uh, these 16 and a half puts were still active, and the 1,600 puts were not. We saw about 1,500 on Tuesday, about 2,000 on Wednesday, almost 1,500 today. So a total of about 7,500 going up this week. So someone really had an ax to grind on these 16 and a half puts and traded them fairly actively pretty much all week. 1,600 puts doing number two, about 6,200 contracts, so about 1,200 less uh, than the other. And looks like every day they were close to in line with the 16 half puts, but slightly less, except for that Monday day. So there could have been a bit of a 16 half, 1600 vertical. Again, that's a, those are interesting strikes to be picking right now because they are fairly out of the money. But again, November, you got a little bit of time for that to come to fruition. And then we also had going to the other side, number three, we actually have the Dees 1900s going up about 5,000 times almost exactly this week. Let's see. The lion's share of that is actually today. I said about 5,100 contracts have gone up 4,400 today. So something is on fire out there today. Looks like it might be another one of these funky verticals. Listen, it's like about 2,000 of the 18 halves have traded, 4,400 of the 1900s, and then 1,500 of the 2,000s. So a bit of a weird fly if that is indeed the case, but on a bit of a ratio, but it could potentially be 1,800 18 half, 1900, 2000 fly in December. Does that one float your boat? Those strikes don't really excite me, but hey, to each their own out there, 5,000 of the 1900 calls also doing the dance out there today. Let's go really a little bit farther out really quick. I like to do a little bit longer term upside in the precious stuff because there's always something funky lurking, usually a pretty funky fly. Let's see what's going up here. 2000 of the, I should say 3000 of the DC 2022. 2,000 calls have also traded also today. <laughs> Actually, I take that back. Those traded on Tuesday. Those were all opening, followed by 1,000 of the 1,800s on the same day. So one by three, no other legs against it, really. So if that's a spread, that's just straight up one by three, which is also strange out there. But intriguing stuff. Mr. Rhodes, any of this gold paper surprise you out there, sir? Well, you, you you stopped before you got all the way down to January of next year, where the most actives were the 1,500 puts. <laughs> and somebody thinks the, the world's coming to an end. That's true. They only did about 3,000 <laughs> contracts, but they did trade. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my goodness. You, you got to think, and, I, and actually, after I'm on with you, I'm going to uh, get on... I'm going to get on the horn with Spencer, my intern at Indiana University, who gets on the Bloomberg and gets some information for me. I'm going to look at some of the block trading and see if maybe the 1650 puts in November and these 1500 puts are being combined with something else. Because uh, it, it just seems almost silly that I mean, if you if you're going to sell one of those just to, with the thought that we're not going to have a massive drop in the price of gold, are you really going to get an awful lot from it? And when I see way out of the money options like that trading, I assume it's part of a spread and maybe it's just being done to uh, make the risk managers happy. You know, like selling the 2100s or something, 2100 puts and buying the 16 and a half puts or something like that. Yeah, there's all sorts of funky flow afoot out there in the shiny stuff. Before we roll all the shiny stuff really quickly, let's go out to the other ones. We were talking about silver a lot on the option block. Let's just see what's going on out there. It's off still this week, off about 1.2%, about a quarter of a point on the week. It's not a huge move, but it is only much lower, obviously, than gold. 22.165 coming into showtime. And silver does decent paper. Again, it's not gold. It's only about 30,000 contracts, but still, that's... That's a decent number two out there in the metals these days. And of that, nearly half, about 44% coming, once again, in the Nova contract has about 26 days to go. The vol and silver, a little bit more frothy in case you're wondering. Almost a 27, about 2680. Puts it up nearly two points this week. So silver, silver vol, a little bit juicier, a little bit spicier out there. Almost double what gold vol is. In terms of the skew, last week the puts were leading the dance, 5.4% rich. This week they've come in a little bit. 
4.3% rich. The calls last week, 1.7% cheap. This week, 0.6% rich. They have swung almost two points in the other direction out there. So a slight bid to the calls, decent bid to the puts. You almost got a weird little crooked smile going on <laughs> out there in silver right now. In terms of where the action is, I said we're at about a 22.165 out there. It was the 2170 calls, a very interesting strike. Uh, doing about 1,300 contracts in November. That was the big dog out there this week to the tune of, yeah, it looks like half of that trading yesterday, half of that trading today, most of that opening. And then that was kind of the big trade, followed by the 20 half puts, almost 1,300 of those going up this week as well. Again, the big days were half of it Wednesday and half of it again today pretty much. So yesterday and today, the big days for silver options in November. And then, again, I always like looking a little bit farther out and to the upside, because that's where the action usually is in metals. And this week, we saw 1,200 of the Dece 2022 40s going up. And that's to actually went up this morning, went up today. So we don't have OI changes on that. But man, that is, that is a lot of the 40s to go up by Dece of next year. Also saw 300 of the 25s going up. Again, that's a one by four. People are doing some weird ratios out there. But I, I've seen weirder things, but it looks like it's, it's more of the straight up 40s. Mr. Rhodes, are you in love with these Dece 2022 40s in silver? I would love to see the Dece uh, 2021 40s work out because I've been long the, uh, the Dece 20s uh, for some time now. <laughs> thinking that uh, I put them on about six months ago. And I was actually, I was thinking at some point we might get uh, people that don't think we're transitory anymore. And maybe that inflation is on the, uh, on the horizon and, and it would show up in the price of silver and it has not worked out particularly well. Yeah, I think whoever's buying those forties. And again, I'm assuming they're buying. I haven't had a chance to dig into it. Whoever's trading those forties, maybe subscribing back to that uh, whole uh, squeezy McSqueezerstein view on silver because that would be effectively doubling be between now and Dece of next year again if the inflation numbers are out there maybe there could be some some grist for that mill really quickly before we roll out of metals as well because it was copper that was actually on our movers and shakers this week copper was number three to the dark side off three and a half percent coming into showtime it's about 4.1 right now so it's off about 4.17 percent this week Twenty, how much copper does it's about a third of silver about ten thousand contracts almost exactly so Again, it's not blowing the doors off, but it's one of the more active of the metals. In terms of where that action is right now, it is once again out there. This one's in Dece, actually. 61% of that 10,000 contracts going up in Dece. The vol and copper, again, we're kind of, we keep ticking up the vol spectrum. First, we had a 14 in gold. Then we had nearly double that in silver. Now we're up to a 31 and a half in copper here, up about two and a half points this week alone. So, a little bit juicier, a little bit frothier out there in copper. Skew, let's see, last week, 4.2% rich with the puts. This week, 5.7% bid. And last week, the calls were 2.3% cheap. This week, 3.5% cheap. So calls getting more offered, puts getting more bid. Again, has a bit of an equity flair to it. In the terms of the action, I said we're at a 4.1 out there in copper right now. It was the three half puts in December doing about 1,100 contracts. So again, that's over 10% of all the paper out there just in these three half puts. And pretty much all of them traded on Monday, listeners, about 1,100 of them, pretty much all of those opening. Also worth noting, a little under 1,100 of the 360 puts also traded. So maybe a very funky, tight vertical <laughs> was dominating your copper paper doing about 20% of the overall contracts. Mr. Rhodes, it's kind of hard to talk copper without also talking the flip side of it, which is Chinese demand that drives everything out here. But copper was moving again this week, giving up a little bit of the ghost this week. Anything catching your eye out there in copper, sir? Well, you know, I'm, I'm looking over the same page. As you talk through them, I, I look over the same pages just uh, to, to try and keep up with you. And what really just copper, silver, gold, all of them together, uh, it's pretty interesting to see that the put skew is pretty high for copper. Uh, but that's not the way it is. It's kind of mixed, or if anything, leaning to the call side on silver and gold going a little bit farther out, which makes you wonder if well, what you just said you kind of beat me to the punch on that one. If the, the outlook for us doing business with China is not all that bullish, and, and that really is what's keeping pressure, on, keeping pressure on copper, but not just that. Uh, but having people think that maybe the pressure on copper is not over and will continue. 
And the show will definitely continue. Mr. Rhodes is doing double duty here, holding down multiple seats. So let's head on out to the equities next. It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, everybody, let's do it. Let's dive headlong into the equities. We're going to talk equities. We also have to talk the flip side of that coin, which is volatility. And we're seeing some more of it again on the screen today. You know, it's been one of those weird weeks where kind of all eyes have been glued down there to D.C. Will they, won't they with the debt deal? Will they, won't they with spending a lot of dollars on the line down there in D.C. this week? And that tends to make the market skittish. That's pretty much what we've been seeing. We've been seeing some sell-offs earlier this week. Today, we had a rally earlier in the session. Then we started selling off, wiped out all those gains, and we're pretty much right across the board. Then we started rallying again. The NASDAQ actually is still green. The S&P and the Dow right now are still in the red. All this back and forth means we got a little bit more vol creeping back onto the screen. RVX, which is, of course, the VIX of the Russell 2000, is up nearly three points, about 2.85 points from this time last week at about a 2780 or so. We got VIX Cash coming into Showtime. Is that about a 23 and a quarter? That's up about four and three quarters points from where it was this time last week. VVIX is back up to the level that used to be the floor during the pandemic. Used to be, it never got below 120 for the lion's share of the pandemic era. Then, of course, you broke through it earlier this year, and now it, it has to struggle to get back there. But it did this week. Got up to 120. Now it's up about 118 uh, coming at the start of today's show. Still up about nine and a quarter points from where it was on last week's show. And VOLQ, a.k.a. the At The Money Vol of the NASDAQ 100, a.k.a. the newest tradable vol product over there in the land of CME, up about five and a half points this week to about 22 and two-thirds or so out there. So that's been a while since we've seen VOLQ getting a nice, nice aggressive 20 handle to it. It takes a lot to really to bump that number up and move that needle, it seems like, out there. But it's doing it today. That puts that VIX to RBX spread at around four and a half points. That's about almost two points tighter than it was this time last week, about 1.9 points uh, tighter. But again, both of those are whipping around like crazy, so not surprising to see some big moves out there. And the VIX to Vol Q is right around two-thirds, which actually puts it about two-thirds of a point tighter than it was this time last week as well. So a lot of fascinating stuff to unpack. Of course, Mr. Rhodes, I do refer to you as the once and future Dr. VIX, so you do like to hang your hat out there in the realm of volatility. You have written one or two or maybe half a dozen volatility-oriented tomes. So what is catching your eye out there in the land of volatility, sir? Well, this this move that we're seeing in VolQ, and it's just been over the past couple of days where it's uh, catching up and surpassing VIX, uh, I, I did a little bit of a, a ciphering, as Jethro would say, and <clears throat> found that if, if VolQ... Uh, VolQ and VIX flip-flop an awful lot, in fact, uh, and, and it has to do with uh, they both have different underlying markets, but there's also different calculation methodologies. But even though there are different methodologies, uh, it, or maybe because there's different methodologies, they sometimes one's at the premium and sometimes the other's at a premium. And at, during earnings month, which tomorrow is the beginning of October, which is an earnings month. Uh, if Vol Q is, is at a premium to VIX as we go through the month, uh, that is usually an indication that we're going to get a couple of large NASDAQ stock blowups in earnings season. And Vol Q is acting like that right now. So I know, I know we're supposed to be talking about you know, options on futures and the futures market. But the vol Q action just in the last couple of days, and even you know with uh, Nasdaq holding up a bit, uh, and vol Q still kind of holding up as well relative to VIX, uh, I think we're looking out 30 days, and and there's some risk to the Nasdaq at the end of this month. And I'm glad you noticed that because I was going to ask you about that because that that's definitely <laughs> stood out to me as well. It takes a lot to really move that vol Q needle. I've been surprised sometimes at how. VolQ likes to hang out when the rest of the Vol products are jumping around. And you're right, a lot of that has to do with some of the underlying mechanics and what's going on out there. But this past week, not so much. VolQ is playing and moving in lockstep, if not exceeding a lot of these other volatility indices out there. So that is interesting and perhaps an indicator that something, something perhaps is afoot 
and in the offing in the near future in NASDAQ land. If you listen to our advisors option show, you have to be in the secret club to listen to it right now. I'll be hitting the network soon. I'll give you a quick spoiler. Matt, our buddy from ORATS, who's been on this show many times in the past, also kind of hinted looking at his earnings data, his earnings vol data. He thinks perhaps we're in store for some interesting times ahead from an overall earnings vol perspective as well. So a couple of different indicators now showing us that perhaps eh, stay tuned, stay glued to uh, the future out here because there could be some interesting and perhaps topsy-turvy times ahead of us. So speaking of topsy-turvy, let's head on out to small caps because they have been moving quite a bit out there of late as well. Doing some decent paper today, only already about 25,000 contracts on the tape. So a pretty active one. It's outpacing most of those metals we were just talking about already. Coming into showtime at about a 22.17, almost 22.18. Puts it off about 1.2% just from the Monday session off about 26 handles or so. And again, like all equities, the lion's share of the paper at about 21% going out in about a few seconds. <laughs> so let's go out to let's go out to the week three October contract. Because that did about 20% of the paper, and that also has 15 days to go. So that's right at our cutoff. A nice two weeks gives us a little bit of meat on the bone to analyze there. If you are curious what the vol is, I mean, we just talked RBX pushing a 28, but remember, that's kind of the the VIX methodology, that's your 30-day kind of rolling number. It's got skew and everything else baked into that. If you want to look at the straight at the money vol out there in that week three contracts, almost a 25, about a 24 and three quarters. That's still up about four and a third points from this time last week. So small caps remain juicy, remain frothy out there from an overall vol perspective. So everyone was out there, oh, wringing your hands. I can't get a lot of vol, even though you can get more vol this week than you could last week. <laughs> small caps can certainly deliver for you. In terms of skew, We've got the puts last week, 15.2% rich this week, nearly 16%. So remember I said before, these bids and these equities are, are getting kind of strong. Uh, let's see the calls last week, 11.6% cheap this week, even cheaper, nearly 13% cheap out there. So calls coming in, puts getting more bid. That's kind of the tail of the tape out there in most equity options these days. In terms of the action, again, people are always asking, what about small Delta calls in Russell 2000? Let us see. If they are lighting it up this week. And you know, it looks like it was those week three Octobers. Actually, it looks like I take it back. Let's, let's go a little bit farther out. It looks like it's kind of a tie between the 2280s going out in a few minutes. So, yeah, those are technically very small delta right now, as well as the 23 doubles out there. And looks like the uh, monthly Octobers that have about 29 days uh, to go. Both of those doing about the same amount of paper 23 double. That's an interesting strike as well. Again, you're talking about 100 handles, 140 actually handles away from where we are right now. So those would be smaller delta, that is for sure. <laughs> and actually, you know what? The other thing I've always noticed out here is the interest in pretty far out of the money puts. This week, we're seeing some action in those as well. In fact, actually, the number one contract just outpacing those upside calls are actually the D's 21 double puts, 21.55 puts that that is the number one contract out here so those are farther out though not quite as small from a you know from an or far out of the money as we typically see they've been kind of trading all week trading today and trading on tuesday as well it's like opening on both so at least for the tuesday we don't really know today's yet so interesting stuff kind of playing by the script out there in small caps out of the money smaller delta calls and then Farther out of the money, but not quite as far as you typically see. Usually we would see something like, you know, a, a Dece or maybe a March of next year, 2,000 puts, something pretty far out of the money. These 21 doubles are a little bit closer than perhaps we have seen in the past. Mr. Rhodes, I know you look at a lot of rut out there when you're not just analyzing all things vol. What is lighting up your tape out there this week, sir? Well, with it's not necessarily this week with respect to rut, but... I'm very excited that we're getting into the fourth quarter. I've, I've been uh, looking at how small caps versus basically how the Russell 2000 versus the NASDAQ 100 versus the S&P 500, uh, if there are some seasonal patterns in there. And I was I had to double check my numbers uh, when I took a look at the fourth quarter and small cap stocks relative to um, the S&P 500 and large cap and tech stocks, uh, especially the last two months of the year. It's it's like we used to talk about a Santa Claus rally. It, it didn't seem to show up in the other indexes anymore. It still shows up in the small cap stocks. Everybody's buying small caps for Christmas. So um, I'm, we're about a month away from where I want to be. 
But I do think that maybe long the Russell 2000 and short one of those other indexes, maybe even short the NASDAQ 100, I think that's the one that seemed to do the worst in December, uh, might make an awful lot of sense. And, you know, you said this week, and I'm sorry, but I'm looking farther out. And I, I've been in contact with some of the FTSE Russell folks this week about uh, putting out a few more pieces very quickly uh, for people to maybe take advantage of that seasonality. There you go. Hard to believe we're talking Santa Claus already, but that's where we that's where, that's where we find ourselves <laughs> out there. What's he called across the pond? Is he Father Christmas over there? What is he? What is he I called guess. in your neck of the woods out there these days? But yeah, intriguing stuff afoot. Again, all these indicators are pointing to that we probably haven't seen the last of the vol and the action out here in the equity space. That's of course assuming we have some sort of resolution to the Washington drama that's going on out here this week. If not, then that's a it's a whole other can of worms that we have to open up on the show next week. And, you know, we're looking here at the movers and shakers. There's really not a lot of energy except for the one frequent offender out there these days. WTI has been kind of quiet, but not its compatriot out there, Nat Gas. So let's hang our hats out there next. It's time to tap into the deep options well of black gold, Texas tea, nat gas, and more. It's time to talk energy. All right, everybody. Welcome to the energy segment. You guys know where to go. Go to that drop down, listeners. Pop it out of equities. Go back up to energy. Go over to the product family. You can see there's a ton of things in there. Not a lot of options going up on most of those, but you can find them in nat gas. Look on nat gas. Go to that top of the Nat Gas product tree. You don't want to go digging into all the rest. Most of the paper is in that top one there, listeners. And then you will find Nat Gas for today at about a 580 coming into showtime, up about 0.6, or it's, it's had quite the move since we even, the beginning of this week, up 11 and three quarters percent just this week. Of course, you add in the move from last week's show. It's up 13 and three quarters percent. So Nat Gas has had quite the run, quite the rebound. How much paper on the tape? Right now in Nat Gas, yeah, it's putting up some numbers, closing in on half a million contracts, 482,000 right now in Nat Gas land, listeners. And unlike the equities, all this paper is not going away tomorrow. In fact, 36% of it is going up in the November contract over there that has about 26 days to go. So it gives us a lot of time to sink our teeth into this one. If you're curious, what is the vol out there in Nat Gas right now? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it, I think to call it volatile would be a, an understatement. You know, we're always talking about Bitcoin and all these other things that are flirting with triple digits, but we have forgotten and neglected the volatility that is out there in that gas right now because it's pretty juicy. It's closing in on a 100. Is that about a 95 right now, listeners? It's up 27 points this week. My Goodness, that's a huge shift. And we're seeing that kind of across the board. Obviously, this is going to be centered in the front portion of the curve. So the lion's share of that move. The D's contracts at a 106 and a half. That's up 25 and a half points. Uh, the Jan contract for next year, 108. That's up 19, almost 20 points. Uh, <laughs> you get farther out, you get all the way out to March. It's at about a 106, it's up 15, nearly 16 points. Then it calms down. You get out to like April next year, you're talking about a 54. So the ball gets cut in half. But that front portion of that curve where all the madness has been of late in that gas, yeah, that's pretty frothy. So once again, you know, you, all you folks out there wringing your hands, I can't find my vol in the equity products or whatever the heck else it is. I know it's not your usual stomping grounds and you may not be comfortable trading it, but it does a lot of paper. You could certainly do worse than that gas from a volume and liquidity and certainly from a volatility perspective. Just bear in mind, pay attention to it, learn how it trades, learn the skew. Don't just dive straight from, let's say, Tesla options into nat gas. But over time, if you can get acclimated to it, there are worse places to focus some of your trading than nat gas land. Like I said, coming into the show, we're at about 580, 36% of it going up in that, in that contract that has about, oh, 26 days to go. Uh, let's see, skew wise, we're looking at a pretty decent discount to the puts right now because all the action has been to the upside. 8.6% cheap were the puts last week. This week, a little bit less cheap, about 7% cheap. The calls last week were 7.4% bid. This week, 5.8%. So the call is coming in a little bit as well. In terms of the action, where is the big trade, the most active contract out here this week? Looks like listeners, it was the four half puts, which are substantially out of the money 
That's interesting. Doing nearly 20,000 contracts, about 19,500 or so. Uh, the big day was Monday, about 8,400. Over half of that opening, followed by Wednesday, about 6,500. Only about a third of those opening on Wednesday. So maybe a lot of back and forth on this strike. Seems like both days, a total of, like I said, about 19,000, almost 19,500 going up out there. Followed hot on their heels by the five puts with about 18,100 going up this week. Again, similar action the busiest day though was actually tuesday for this one about 5200 4300 on monday and about 4800 today so not quite lining up exactly one to one like it was all four half five verticals even though i'm sure some of those were going up and looks like it was opening on most of the days on the five put so even more opening activity on the five puts which isn't entirely surprising it's closer to the closer to where we're trading out there so intriguing stuff Let's keep on looking, see if we see any other weird prints out here in good old Nat Gas. We got, you go farther out, you get to more rational strikes, like the two and three quarter puts going up in D's of next year a thousand times. So that's obviously beyond the crazy front portion of the Nat Gas curve. We also saw it wasn't all puts all the time. It was, uh, let's see, six calls also trading this week. 11,200 of those, the most active day actually today, almost 4,000 on the tape today. 3,100 on Monday, and the rest kind of scattered throughout the week. And again, back and forth each day for opening and closing. So a lot of back and forth on the sixes as well, which are close to the at the money calls now. So not surprising that those are getting some action out there. Mr. Rose, Nat Gas has been a, a fascinating product to watch of late, sir, in terms of just movement. It's rallying hard one week. It's selling off the next. Also interesting to watch because, you know, the traditional – and the conventional wisdom around Nat Gas is that it's kind of a siloed product. It's locked to the U.S. It doesn't really get buffeted by the winds of international Nat Gas markets. But these days, not so much. A lot of it is is exported to other markets now. So we are seeing that demand overseas start to drive stuff up here. And look all the correlation you're starting to see. It used to be around 50%. Excuse me. Now it's getting closer to 100%. Now it's getting closer to one to one out there. So very different Nat Gas market now than what it was a few years ago. Uh, well, it, I find it kind of interesting that the put activity is through the cold months and the call activity uh, is popping up when things are start are, are supposed to start warming up. And my impression was uh, with Nat Gas, and it's not something I know that much fundamentally about, but uh, my impression was always that uh, there was increased demand in the wintertime and then it kind of petered off in the summertime. Uh, but the options are telling an exactly opposite story. Are we are we sending nat- are we sending nat gas you know to south of the equator where it gets cold during the summertime? Uh, I, that 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 was kind of what popped up it, it, just looking at the activity here. It is weird stuff afoot. Speaking of weird stuff, we have a lot of weird stuff to parse in other segments. Or do you want to dive into the listener mail? You're the guest, sir. I will let you choose where we head next. Very good at fielding left field questions. So let's go to the listener mail. All right, let's do it. It is time, listeners, for your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for futures options feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider stocktwits.com slash options insider or via questions at the options you can also submit your feedback via our options insider radio network mobile app available for ios android and kindle fire devices you can even ask your questions live via our mixler chat room so grab the mixler app or just search for options insider at mixler.com that's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Futures Options Feedback, the portion of the show where you folks take the reins, ask us your questions. Sometimes we turn the spotlight back on you. We kind of uh, got busy doing other things, didn't have a lot of questions of the week and polls for you. A lot of you missed them. So we brought them back for you. You guys are having a lot of fun playing along. If you want to participate in our question of the week and everything else we do, over there on the Twitters, at Options is the place to go, and a lot of you follow us there. If you go there, you can participate in our current question of the week, where we asked you, you know, Straddles, they have a bit of a mixed reputation in the world of options. Some folks love them, others hate them. Quite simply, do you trade Straddles? But we know we have to throw you some sort of curveball, and it can't just be straight yes or no. We had to throw 
a third option in there. So we gave you three choices. Yes, I love them. No, I hate them. Or I prefer flies slash condors. A lot of you have chimed in with your thoughts before we get to those. Mr. Rhodes, what are your thoughts? Are you a Shadow fan? Do you hate Straddles? Do you prefer flies or iron condors? And then B, more importantly, what do you think our audience is voting for, sir? I prefer flies and condors. Uh, and it's just probably, you know, when I was at the Options Institute long, long, long ago, uh, when you're the junior guy and somebody called up upset, because of something that happened within the option market, you got to be the person that uh, tried to talk them off the cliff and explain maybe what happened. And I would have a lot of straddle and strangle sellers that had gotten run over that would call in periodically. And being the junior guy at the Options Institute for seven years, I heard seven years of those wo stories of woe. So, you know, I always feel like you want to have some sort of risk control on, at least when you're selling those guys. But on the other side of it, I know that straddle and strangle pricing is so efficient that over time, you're, you're really not going to do particularly well unless you offset some of the cost. So I also, you know, like selling the, or you know, if I'm going to buy a straddle or strangle, if, if I think there's a volatility event coming up, but I don't know the direction, actually, I'm going to sell some out of the money options as well to offset some of that uh, time value in the option. So that is, uh, without even thinking about it, I would have uh, vote. That's what I would have voted for. I, and I have not seen the voting or anything else. What do you think our audience is voting for? I would think they probably go along with me, but we'll see. Yeah, I kind of fall in that category, too. I'm definitely more of a fly guy than I am a straddle. Not so much on the condor. I've never been a big condor guy for reasons I've discussed here on the network many times over the years. I prefer to get a little bit more, more action, a little bit more spice in my stew there. But yeah, I'm, I definitely would lean that way. But our audience is actually leaning, yes, I love straddles, 47.4%, followed by number two, I prefer flies and condors, 31.6%. And bringing up the rear, another one I thought would have more love, no, I hate them. 21.1%. So intriguing. You folks like yourselves some straddles, a lot of feedback in various forms to J4340 saying strangles, yes, but straddles generally no. Age of Del Aquarius says selling straddles, no. Unlimited upside risk on the naked call. Buying straddles, no. I don't take trading advice from infomercials. Flies and condors, yes. So I'm guessing he lined up for the fly and condor option. And then we have a swish poor saying not as much. He likes straddles, but not as much as a covered strangle. So a lot of thoughts there. Others have weighed in, some with less than, uh, less than savory handles, <laughs> which we won't read here on the show. Instead, let's go on. You know, this is another question we get in various flavors and variations all the time here. Russell, this comes from Melton. Or is it Angela? I can't tell. Maybe uh, I can't tell who's one of those two asked this question. <laughs> says, are there any commodity ETFs? that are as good as SLV and GLD in terms of replicating the actual underlying commodity without suffering from some sort of negative roll yield? Yes, this is a, a perennial question here on the show. A lot of you tune into a show like this. You hear us talking about whatever it might be, nat gas, metals, ags, pick your poison. And a lot of you are still, for a variety of reasons, you don't want to take that step or it's still maybe a little bit intimidating uh, you haven't taken that step onto the futures and futures options front. So you look for a way to replicate this in your securities account. And that's where some of these Franken products come in. And the ones, as you mentioned, the ones we've always recommended are SLV and GLD, if you're into the metals, because they hold the physical. They don't suffer from all these crazy issues that a lot of the other products suffer from, like, you know, your USO. USO is a completely different product than what it was even a couple of years ago out there. But all these other ones that attempt to replicate Different futures exposure all have inherent issues with them. Depends where they're lining up on the front portion of the curve, middle portion of the curve, back end of the curve, maybe some smattering they're in. All of them have their pros and cons. And so there's always going to be some sort of drag as a result of that. SLB and GLD don't suffer from that problem, which makes them attractive. But again, you can go take a metal and throw it in a warehouse and store it somewhere. Easier to do that than it is with some of these other more perishable commodities out there. So Mr. Rhodes... The perennial question, are there any others out there that you like as much as SLB and GLD just from an underlying tracking and functionality perspective, sir? From And I'm not saying that I, because I don't know anything about the market, but I believe that there is a physical platinum one. 
and <laughs> which because it's physical and and it's got over a billion dollars in it. Actually, I looked it up now. It's the Aberdeen Standard Physical Platinum Shares ETF. Uh, I I think that one does what you would want it to do, which is track the spot. But uh, otherwise, you know, when you get into the energy markets, like you said, there's a uh, the the storage is. Uh, it, it just makes it too difficult to have a physical oil ETF that's worth a darn. So uh, I think beyond the metals, it just becomes too difficult to do something like that. Yeah, unfortunately, it is pretty much limited to the metals because they're easy to store, easy to warehouse. I just pulled up this this ETF you're talking about here, uh, Russell. It's the Aberdeen Standard Physical Platinum Shares, ticker symbol PPLT, if you are intrigued, listeners. It's trading $90.34. I'll have to go dig into this a little bit and see what's going on uh, with that versus uh, the price of platinum. But uh, intriguing stuff out here. I have to look and see what kind of volume. It, I'm not sure if this is optionable. I'll have to go dig and see for this one as well. Not one that I've kind of paid a lot of attention to, uh, but an intriguing option. But yeah, unfortunately, Melton or Angelo, maybe both of you asked this question. We get this question a lot. Outside of the metals, it's very difficult. And it's, it's you know, just think about it. How would you replicate you know, exposure in some of these futures. Everyone has a different approach and they're not all right. They're not all wrong. It's just a question how you like to approach it. So they're going to track the underlying differently as a result. If you're more heavy towards the front portion of the curve, you may track a little better, but you're going to get crushed by the roll. If you go farther out along the futures curve, it's going to be a little bit more safe from the roll yield, but your tracking is going to be a little bit less accurate. So there's all sorts of trade-offs. There's no free lunch out there and there's no perfect way to do it, unfortunately. So yeah, outside of the metals, there there really aren't a lot. You kind of, if you want to avoid those roll issues and everything else, you kind of got to go out to the futures option. I know that's maybe not the answer you want, but that's kind of it right now. So you can hang out in your GLDs, your SLBs, maybe your PPLTs in the metal space. For everything else, we we kind of recommend you folks get out there and start dipping your toes into the futures and futures options. Water, come on in. The water's fine. It's nice. Not that scary. All right, everybody, that music means we've come to the end of another epic sojourn through the world of all things futures options. I want to thank our guest, the once in future Dr. Bix, bravely beaming in from across the pond. He's skipping out on Bond movies, $50 Bond movies, just, just to talk to you folks, Mr. Rhodes. So, A, how long are you going to be in London for? Any other fun stuff on the agenda? Are you going to hit the tower or anything? No, I'm not doing anything fun. I've got a couple of work-oriented things tomorrow, and then I jump on a plane and come home on Saturday. So nothing exciting. i got to remember bonbons for the family. Ah, yes, the old bonbons. And if folks want to keep track of all your research, could be equity volatility, could be any of these other products you're talking about here, uh, where should they go? What should they do? And you got any teases for us on what's coming down the pike? I do have a teaser that's uh, future. It's option future oriented. Uh, anything I do, I, t- I typically uh, brag about it on Twitter. Uh, so you know, my handles my full name at Russell Rhodes. Uh, EQderivatives.com. That's uh, anything that I write up is in front of the paywall. So and I'm usually putting up something a couple times a week. And what am I working on that'll be kind of interesting to this audience? I'm looking. I, I've done work in the past on leveraged viral right indexes i'm taking a look at uh what would happen if you owned the the front month s p futures and sold different options against it and had a certain amount of capital set aside for that instead of trying to leverage it up with a portfolio and index options so uh when i finish work on that i bet you can have me back so i can talk about that Leverage buyer? Actually, talking like maybe owning the underlying and then selling, let's say, two calls on the upside. Is that how you're leveraging it? No, no, no. Um, leveraging the amount of capital instead. Oh, okay. Of, uh, being a hundred instead of having to own all the stocks. Um, you know, maybe uh, only having to have thirty percent of the capital because that's what you need for the margin for the futures, and selling options on futures continuously against the futures. I like it. Fascinating stuff. You can give them a follow over there on the old Twitters. It's Russell, two S's, two L's, and then Rhodes, R-H-O-A-D-S. He doesn't spell it the easy way. Because what fun would that be? At Russell Rhodes on the old Twitter. The best way to get at just all of his stuff he's putting out there. Tweets, blurbs. He's pretty active on Twitter, listeners. He also likes himself a murder hornet or two. Check him out over there on the old Twitter. While you're on Twitter, give a follow to the folks over there at FTSE Russell as well. At FTSE Russell. Go to FTSERussell.com for all the data, all the analysis, all the cool stuff. They have some new weeklies hitting the tape. 
very soon. In fact, I do believe we have Tim McCourt coming on next week from CME to break down all that action and a whole bunch more. So all of you out there who've been asking for, hey, we want more exposure, more ways to trade options on this small cap thing because we kind of like the small caps. You're getting more of them coming next week. So stay tuned for that. And of course, you know where to go to get access to these reports and everything else we're doing over there. See me group.com slash twifo or slash twio. Both of those will get you to our content over there. And on behalf of Mr. Rhodes and our friends over there in Footsie Land and everybody in See Me Land and Eddie myself, thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, and subscribing. That does conclude our broadcast day for today, but never fear. We're back again tomorrow, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern for volatility views. Then back again after that for all of you in the Secret Club for 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern for Options Oddities. Then back next week to kick off all the content on Monday, all the way through to another Thursday and another episode of This Week in Futures Options. We'll see you then. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME Group. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEGroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.